All right, good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for joining all of us at the American Heart Association's Check It Community Conversation Series today. Be well and know the signs. My name is Farah Jadrin. I am the CBS 5 Morning and Noon Anchor, as you can see a little bit there from my bio on your screen right now. I'm honored to be here with everyone. Heart health is so important. I've been a big advocate of women's health for uh, my entire life and more so in my adult life as, I, as I've learned so much more about how important it is to listen to our bodies and make sure that we're being our best health advocates. I did that a lot as editor for Syracuse Woman Magazine and now do it as much as I can as an anchor that is speaking to the community every day. I learned just a few months ago and announced officially to everybody yesterday that I am pregnant. So more so than ever, I am really thinking about heart health and brain health, not just for me, but for my baby as well. I will be your moderator today. Again, so grateful to be here and thank the Heart Association of New York State for asking me to be here. Uh, this month, we are looking at American Stroke Month. It is also National uh, High Blood Pressure Education Month and Mental Health Awareness Month. So let's focus on our brain health a bit today. We're gonna learn how some things intertwine like our high blood pressure and stroke risks can intertwine. Most people who have had a first stroke actually have also had high blood pressure. So you're going to hear more about that a little bit later. Uh, since February, the American Heart Association has been encouraging everyone to check their blood pressure and know their numbers, but you have to also take control. So that's another thing the Heart Association is focusing on. Uh, those numbers will be looked at and can be changed through any lifestyle modifications and also some healthier habits as well. All right, so the Check It Challenge would not be possible without our generous sponsors and their support. So you're gonna see them on your screen right now. Uh, today's session sponsor is Lords. If this is your first Check It community conversation, we welcome you. We know this has been a series going on for the entire month with the Check It Challenge wrapping up now, but you can still take control of your blood pressure and learn more at www.heart.org slash lower your HBP. So think heart, blood pressure, your HBP. All right, today we have an amazing panel, as you've already seen, signing up for today's conversation. You're going to hear from many of these incredible people, all of them very soon. Um, as we always say, we want this to be a conversation. So we are looking forward to you sending us in questions as well. To start, uh, we want you to introduce yourself in the chat box. I saw a few of you doing that already, so good job. Add your name or company where you're joining us from. And while you're doing that, I'm actually going to ask David Four, president of Visual Technologies, to come on screen and share his story. David, we want to thank you uh, for joining us today and sharing your story. Good morning, all. Um, again, my name is David Four. I'm uh, the president of Visual Technologies and a stroke survivor. Um, back on Saturday, December uh, 10th of 2016, I was uh, headed up to the Carrier Dome to watch an SU basketball game with some friends. When we got in the dome, um, I had a, a kind of a migraine uh, headache and I was only able to see five players on the court. Um, I attributed that to, a, uh, to the migraine headache and I sat quietly with my friends, uh, watched the game, and afterwards, while they went out for beers, I went home again thinking that I had a migraine. Well, uh, next morning, Sunday, I woke up. It was still there. I went to immediate care thinking that maybe the migraine was caused by a sinus infection. Uh, again, went home, rested, woke up on Monday morning and said, my vision wasn't right. The migraine was still there. And uh, I, I attributed it to a vision issue called my optometrist, went in, and after two hours of, of all different types of tests, they pulled me aside and they said, we need you to contact uh, your primary. We believe you had a stroke. Uh, contacted my primary. He looked at the results from the optometrist and said, David, you, uh, I want you to go up, to, I 
want you to uh, go up to Upstate immediately and admit yourself. Um, went in after uh, a series of tests and things, it was determined that I had a mini stroke and mine was vision related. And uh, I can tell you it was, uh, in looking back, it was uh, very scary not to have recognized uh, some of the very blatant symptoms of, of a mini stroke. Um, the, the most, in, the, the most uh, prevalent one for myself was of course the migraine, the headache and the blurriness. Uh, those two things should have set off some kind of a flag and let me know that uh, I was having some medical issues. Now today, four years later, um, I'm on uh, uh, some meds for the uh, stroke, Eliquis and a few other things, but also uh, mine was determined to be um, sleep related. And so I uh, wear a mask religiously now and uh, sleep very well. Um, proud to say that uh, you know I come to work every day and at 66, I'm, uh, I'm a few pounds overweight, but I, I get my 10,000 steps in every day and um, I'm working at uh, uh, improving my health. But it's very important uh, to recognize that um, the various uh, symptoms of a stroke and um, a migraine and blurriness are two of the ones that uh, um, should have set me off to recognize something else was wrong. But um, I'm happy to share my, my story here today and I wanna thank the uh, American Heart Association uh, for allowing me to, uh, to speak with you all. David, thank you so much. I, I think everyone who is watching now and will watch in the coming days when this recording goes up knows that it's stories like yours that are going to help other people be more health aware, especially when it comes to stroke, because like you said, there were signs, symptoms that you're thinking, how did I miss that? So we thank yeah. you so much for sharing your experience. And we are so happy to hear that you are doing well. And 10,000 steps a day is not easy. So... <laughs> Congratulations, that's incredible. I hope everyone is aspiring to that. David, thank you again. Thank you. Now, as we uh, move on to our panel discussion, we want to remind everybody, we want you to be a part of this conversation and uh, we want you to use the chat box. I'm seeing some pop up at the bottom, wonderful. Put any questions or comments that you have there. We'll ask that your uh, questions uh, those questions that you give us during the Q&A, that's going to be with our speakers after they've each presented. So if you put in a question, don't worry, we're going to get to it in the Q&A. Today's session is being recorded. As I just mentioned, it will be available on New York State American Heart Association's Check It Challenge Facebook event page and the YouTube channel in a few days after the closed captioning has processed. So YouTube channel and the Facebook event page for the Check It Challenge. Uh, events page. If you want to share any of the great information you're learning today, please use the handle you see on your screen at AHA New York and use the hashtag check it. All right, so let's get to our panel. First, I would love to introduce Dr. Anne Lenhart Caprio. Anne is the program coordinator of the University of Rochester Comprehensive Stroke Center at Strong Memorial Hospital, where she works as an interprofessional team to ensure that the high quality evidence-based stroke care is being delivered throughout the hospital. So that's the team that she works with there incredible team at Strong. She maintains an active outpatient practice as a nurse practitioner specializing in stroke care and is very passionate about ensuring patients and the community are educated on how they can work to control their risk factors to help prevent stroke. And it's wonderful to have you here with us. When we think of strokes, we don't always think about high blood pressure. So We'd love for you to tell us how those two are connected so we can keep that in our minds. Absolutely. First, I want to say it is such a pleasure to be here, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to work with the American Heart Association as part of the Check It Challenge because high blood pressure and stroke are so connected. 
High blood pressure is actually one of the leading causes of stroke in the United States and across the world. And I think that probably a lot of people are aware, and I hope if you're not aware, I can help you become aware, that um, around five years ago in the relatively recent past, as we consider it in the medical system, five years is pretty recent, uh, we had new recommendations from the American Heart Association for high blood pressure. And they were a little controversial because really any blood pressure over 120 over 80 is considered to be high blood pressure. And then we start to think about lifestyle changes from 120 over 80 to up to the 130 range. And as you approach 130 and 140, it's time to consider medications. And that was really controversial because what it did was transition a lot of the folks in our country to a diagnosis of hypertension or high blood pressure. But I wanna point out that why those recommendations were made, the evidence behind them was driven by what was found in those people who had a blood pressure over 120 over 80 in a large population and stroke risk. It was found that by controlling blood pressure to that normal range of 120 over 80, that strokes could be prevented. And so it really is part of the driving evidence for high blood pressure management or hypertension management that stroke prevention is at the forefront of it. And actually there are two major types of strokes. Most of them are what we consider ischemic stroke and that's the clotting or blockage type of stroke. And then less frequently there's the hemorrhage or bleeding type of stroke. And high blood pressure is actually a leading cause of both of these types of strokes. And Lisa, it is, excuse me, Lisa, I'm thinking about Lisa Neff on here, just looking That's at your okay. picture. And um, it is Stroke Awareness Month. So what should we know about prevention? You know, prevention of stroke is incredibly important, not just during May, which is Stroke Prevention and Stroke Awareness Month. But I think that the most important and first step in stroke prevention is understanding your risk. And people need to be aware of what their risk factors are and how to manage those risk factors. So when we think about stroke risk, there are two major types of risk factors. There are the things that you can change and there are the things that you can't change. So the things that you can't change are called non-modifiable risk factors. And it's important to be aware of those. And those are things like age, people who, as they get older have a higher risk of stroke. Like uh, gender, women actually have a higher risk of stroke starting around age 45 and younger women are starting to have a higher risk of stroke than men. More women die from stroke than men. And family history. So we can pick our friends, but we can't pick our family and we can't pick our family's medical history. All of those things are things that we can't change. So it's important to be aware of them. However, there are a number of things that we can change and those are called modifiable risk factors for stroke. So understanding what your personal risk factors are is really critical in stroke prevention. And the number one risk factor that I would say people need to be aware of is high blood pressure. You wanna know your numbers. Be checking your blood pressure on a regular basis if you're somebody who has a high blood pressure history or who has a family history of high blood pressure. I will say that I am very lucky. I am in my mid forties and I don't have high blood pressure, but I say this, that I don't have high blood pressure yet uh, because I have a strong family history. And so, you know, you want to make sure that if you don't have high blood pressure yet, you're keeping an eye on it. If you do have high blood pressure, you know that you have a diagnosis of hypertension. It is important to be monitoring your blood pressure on a regular basis because your blood pressure can change over time. And because it's important for you as an advocate for yourself to be working with your primary care provider, your primary care team, in order to ensure that your blood pressure is at goal. Make sure you know that that goal is 120 over 80 and that you are ensuring that you are working with your provider to be striving for that number. So high blood pressure is a silent killer and most people don't know that they are 
having high blood pressure. It doesn't give you symptoms. And unfortunately, one of the primary presenting symptoms of high blood pressure can be stroke. So there are other things that are put you at risk of stroke that can be modifiable, things like atrial fibrillation, which is a heart rhythm that can put people at risk of stroke, diabetes, high cholesterol. All of these things can be dealt with, not just by medication, but also by a healthy lifestyle with diet and exercise, with some of the strategies that our other panelists are gonna talk about today. But it's important that you are getting preventive care and that you are understanding what risk factors you may have and identifying them as they occur so that you can then make these changes in your lifestyle, whether that's diet, exercise, managing your salt intake, and taking medications when necessary. And if, you know, we're doing all of these things, we're working on these modifications, but we still get to that point where we could be having a stroke, what are the signs and symptoms of a stroke? So I want to point out some of the main signs and symptoms of a stroke. And actually, if any of you were watching during the entry slides before we started, you would have seen a slide that said FAST, F-A-S-T. And what that stands for is face, so facial droop or facial asymmetry. A <clears throat> is arm, so you have someone hold their arms out, or you do, and if one drifts down, that's abnormal. S is speech, so abnormal words, difficulty speaking, slurred speech, and T is time, and that's time to call 911 or activate emergency medical systems. So if you remember FAST, that's gonna catch a large number of stroke symptoms. But as you heard earlier, there are also some other stroke symptoms that may be less common that are important to recognize. And those are things like sudden loss of vision on one side, sudden difficulty with walking, uh, sudden confusion. Women have different symptoms and may be more subtle, like a sudden loss of consciousness or sudden confusion. So you wanna remember FAST, but also think about some of those less frequent signs that I also mentioned. And thank you so much. All important information for people, things we can do uh, to keep track of our blood pressure and make sure that we are doing healthy lifestyle choices and also fast. So important for all of us to remember, not just for ourselves, but for a loved one or coworker. And thank you. Uh, remember, if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat box. I saw Franklin put in an important note. If you have specific questions about your own health, that should go to your physician. Uh, that's where you should direct those medical questions about. But if you have questions in general about the topics we're covering today, please put those in the chat box and we're going to cover them during the Q&A session. We're now going to welcome our second guest, Jed Michael. Jed has maintained an apprenticeship uh, several with modern masters of traditional East Asian medicine for more than half his life while remaining clinically grounded. He currently practices acupuncture at Lord's Hospital Department of Integrative Medicine Center for Pain and Wellness in Binghamton, New York. Jed, it's so great to have you with us uh, today. Uh, we just heard from uh, Anne about stroke and some ways to prevent it. Your background is rooted in holistic and integrative medicine. Can you tell us uh, how acupuncture and some of the more non-traditional medicines can actually help our brain health? Who are you calling non-traditional? <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I, I'm actually a big fan of acupuncture. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, well, brain health is body health. It's pretty unlikely you'll find a very healthy brain in, a, in an unhealthy body and vice versa, right? So when we're talking about brain health, we're talking about whole body health. Uh, as far as Chinese traditional medicine is concerned, we have a lot, a lot in common with modern medicine, right? We dovetail very, very well. So some similarities include that the, the founding document of Chinese medicine says essentially that there are modifiable factors and it's so, so important to make those behavioral changes to become and stay healthy. So those include physical exercise, proper nutrition, uh, proper rest, sleeping well, and, and mental stimulation. So 
we have a, a wide variety of tools. Acupuncture itself is one of many tools that are designed to influence the body. So what I often tell my patients is that my entire toolkit is designed to provoke a healing response, right? So essentially we have a whole lot of different ways to stimulate the body and, and coax some healing and some health out of it. So if, for example, you have difficulty exercising because of pain, you might want to get that dealt with, right? Acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, movement therapies, all can be very, very helpful. We have dietary therapies, dietary ideas on, uh, you know, in modern research, you'll want a lot of antioxidant foods so that your brain, uh, to prevent your brain from building up plaques and just sort of gunking up the system. So we have ideas about that in Chinese medicine that might help you decide which of those are best for you, which, which foods, which diet, which ways of preparation. Is, is a soup better or is a salad better for you, right? Um, research is pretty interesting in terms of how we can influence the body. We have peripheral effects, which are ways that we can influence sort of distant parts of our body, right? Everything that's not the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. And we can also influence the central nervous system. So there's a combination of those things going on. Some really, really neat recent research showed that when an organ system is not doing as well as it could, it can cause inflammation along entire tracts of nerves that are related to it. So in the rat model for hypertension, they, they induced hypertension in these rats. They gave them high blood pressure. And then they injected them with this dye that migrates to sites of inflammation. And what they found was that when the rat was stressed out, the acupuncture points that would most commonly be used for high blood pressure became blue. And then they treated those points with uh, a variety of different stimulus. They used acupuncture needles. They used um, just a little bit of a chemical irritant, just something to stimulate the point. And it actually ameliorated that hypertension. It got rid of it in those rats. So a lot more study is needed, but it shows a very, very interesting effect and a direct relationship with the nervous system. Modern, uh, the, the latest push with the American Heart Association and cardiology, as far as I can tell, is to really begin to create a standard for what are now called cardio-neural interventions. There's a relationship between the heart and the brain through the nervous system that the way we handle stress can have an effect in both directions. So our behaviors can have a very direct effect on our blood pressure. If on my way here this morning, I was trying to, to take the exit to get on the highway and someone in front of me stopped a nice healthy distance from the car in front of them and it blocked my way and I got frustrated. And then I started laughing at myself because even the short-term perception of a hassle, just something as simple as that, instantly increased markers in my blood that will uh, promote coagulation and uh, you know, clotting and inflammation. So I realized that wasn't good for me and I changed my mind about it. And the research has shown that just changing my mind about it, catching myself in that moment became therapeutic for me. So there are a lot of different things that we can do to help a person discover what's right for them in particular. Nothing will save your life better than modern medicine. You have to keep up with your medications and stay on top of everything as you just heard. But we have a, a certain range of tools available to us that kind of help everything else run better. They help all the other therapies come together. Very often I have patients come in and they have a series of problems. They have, they have an orthopedic doctor for this and they have an internist for that. And what happens is they eventually begin to feel like a, a bundle of problems that are sort of unrelated. And what we really offer, I think, is that we can create a cohesive story. We, we look for the pattern and we treat that. 
Uh, Jed, I think something important for a lot of us to uh, think about, especially nowadays through the pandemic and maybe uh, people struggling with some mental health issues, uh, when you think about um, even any type of uh, medical or self-care, uh, specifically massage or acupuncture, some people might think of that as treating themselves. How important is it to, to turn your brain to, to view that as treatment not a treat for yourself, but something that you should be doing because it can impact your, your, your mental health, your uh, pain management, things like that. Well, how fortunate is it that it can be both, right? All these treatments have a real wonderful and proven benefit in promoting health. And the fact that people enjoy them is, is very different than what we're used to in medicine. I think that people are catching on and more and better research is being done all the time. Uh, when I see things like uh, migraines, neck pain, back pain, urinary incontinence, PMS and other menstrual complaints, insomnia, uh, even fairly recent traumatic injuries, I love when that stuff comes into my clinic because uh, a lack of response is far and away the exception we tend to get very, very good results with that in my experience. And so when we can treat such otherwise difficult and life impacting things that easily, let me rephrase, that effectively, I, I think the more people who know that and experience that, the, the word will spread. All right, and Jed, our last question for you. Um, I've had acupuncture many times. I don't think it hurts, but what is your uh, description of whether or not it hurts or any potential pain if you're getting acupuncture for the first time? That is what everyone wants to know. Uh, well, acupuncture training essentially allows us to create whatever sensation we want you to feel in the moment. So we work very, very hard to create a painless insertion and the sensations that we can produce when we choose to generally go in the category of weird, not painful. So you may feel it somewhere else in your body. You may feel pressure. You may feel uh, an ache. You may feel euphoria. You may feel nothing at all. If it ever feels like something you would call pain, you simply let your acupuncturist know and they'll be able to take care of that right away. You can enjoy it. You don't have to endure it. Wonderful. All right, Jed, thank you so much. Great information from you. And I hope some people are considering exploring some acupuncture soon. Jed, thank you again. Uh, a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, please use the chat box. Uh, we would like to introduce our third guest now, Dr. Marcel Haddix. Also known as Zen, the Zen G, Dr. Haddix is a certified registered yoga instructor who specializes in yoga and mindfulness for underrepresented groups and for community-based organizations with strong commitments to maternal health and food justice. She is co-founder of the Sankofa Reproductive Health and Healing Center and a founding member of the Cafe Sankofa Cooperative. Her community-engaged approach to yoga, wellness, and healthy living culminates in yoga and writing retreats for women and couples of color, yoga and mindfulness workshops in urban school contexts, and regular yoga classes and sister circles in her community. Dr. Haddix, I want to uh, give you as much time as possible as I'm going to be turning things over to you to walk us through a Be Well meditation before we bring everyone back on the screen for a Q&A portion. So if people didn't read uh, very closely on what was happening in the panel, I hope this is a wonderful surprise for you because I've been looking forward to this myself. Dr. Haddix? Thank you so much. And as you mentioned um, in your introduction, um, I'm also a professor of literacy. And so I'd like to start um, by sharing a poem that I often um, refer back to. So the poem is titled, Won't You Celebrate With Me? by Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, 
What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. My one hand holding tight, my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. The last line of the poem always stays with me. Something has tried to kill me and has failed. In thinking about all of the various stress factors and environmental factors, um, societal issues that impact our everyday lives, I would be remiss not to mention that a year ago today, we know that police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd in Minnesota. And, you know, we've collectively witnessed that and his life, his breath being taken away um, and countless other individuals um, who have lost their lives to whether it be racial violence, environmental violence, um, we think about reproductive health and um, violence against um, individuals' bodies. So the breath and having a breath practice um, is so significant. Our breath is our life force. It's everything. And as I mentioned, we can think about all the things that affect our health, that impact um, our breath, our life force, whether that be stress, anxiety, grief, trauma, that we individually and collectively experience. So today I um, want to take us through a series of different um, breathing exercises um, that I hope that if you do not have a practice that you can incorporate um, into your everyday practice, because I do believe strongly as some of the other panelists have um, spoken to that the, a breath practice, a restorative practice um, is so important. It's critical to add to you know, any medical interventions or any um, other um, you know, remedies that you might um, practice. So I think it's, it's critical. So if you aren't already, wherever you are, I invite you to come to a comfortable seated position or, you know, maybe you're laying, but a comfortable grounded position, one that you might find stillness. And I invite you just to slow down in this moment to pause. and return to your breath. You might gently close the eyes. And as you settle into your grounding position, just notice, notice the breath. Listen to the breath. And just take a moment to take five slow breaths. Inhale deep and full. And exhale. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold the breath for a moment. Then let the breath go through the mouth. A deep and heavy sigh. Release the breath, let it go.
you take time to settle into this moment, into the present, into the now. With every inhale and every exhale, connect your mind and body to your breath. Deepen the breath. Inhale through your nose to the count of five. Hold. Exhale through your nose to a count of seven. Deepen the breath, slow the breath. As you slow down the breath, you quiet the mind and calm the body. Embrace stillness in this moment. How do you feel? What are your thoughts? What do you notice? Breathe in. I am here. I am enough. I matter. Breathe out. I am love and I embrace joy. I let go of self-doubt and I release my fears. Take a deep breath in. Breathe out. Release and let it go. Settle into this moment, into the present, into the now. What do you feel? What do you see? What are your thoughts? And what do you notice? So take the next moments to just notice the breath. Breathing in and breathing out. And as you are ready, you know, allow the eyes to gently flutter open, slowly open the eyes. And I invite you, if you have a journal or something nearby um, to write with or take some notes, I just like to offer um, some more ideas or thoughts as we think about the breath and engaging a breathing practice and the importance and the significance of rest. Rest fuels the breath. When was the last time that you reserved space and time to simply rest? You know, we live such hurried lives 
often guided by to-do lists and checklists, and all the things that we have to do. But when do we give ourselves permission to slow down, to take time, take rest? And again, rest fuels the breath, our life force. And even just by taking a moment to pause and connect with the breath, we disrupt that um, hurried lifestyle, right? That we pause and connect with the breath. One of my favorite authors, Toni Morrison, said, what's the one thing I must do in this lifetime? Otherwise, I will fall off the face of the earth. And anytime that I find myself feeling overwhelmed, ang anxious, stressed, like I have so much to do, so much to get done, um, I think of that, like, what is the one thing that I need to do? And in any moment, the one thing that I need to do is breathe, connect to the breath, attend to my health and my wellness. That's, that's the most important thing, the main priority. So I ask you, as you reflect through the practice, what are the areas of your body and your mind that need rest? When you're in a breathing practice, to where do you need to send the breath for healing, to feel well? And oftentimes we'll say we don't have time. So what hinders you from being able to be still or to take rest? And what kinds of things or conditions might you need to prepare for rest? Why is rest difficult for you? So consider, consider those questions. What is holding you back and not allowing you to rest? And lastly, what part of you is most in need of rest? So in closing, I just would like to offer, again, that rest is as necessary as breath. Rest fuels the breath. Resting is a practice of freedom, and is as necessary as breath. And I'm reading from a book called Gather by Octavia Rahim. And she says that rest allows my heart to remember a slower rhythm. It retrains my cells, blood, soul to trust that there can be rest for the weary. I rest for all of those within me who never could. So when we rest and we take time to be well and to heal our bodies, we're resting for those ancestors and those that came before us, generations before. And we're also making way and creating a legacy for those who will come behind us. So with that, I will give it back to our moderator and thank you again for allowing me to guide you through this Be Well meditation. Marcel, thank you so much. I, I hope I'm speaking for everybody when they say they feel a little bit more sense of relaxation and maybe connectivity with themselves. Um, I just put a, a comment into the chat uh, saying that even as a runner who would try to do some, you know, uh, visualization before a race and, and focus on my breath, I've never thought of it um, in this way to focus on how much it's it's connected to everything that you're feeling. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I've learned something new about my own health and wellness. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, right now we're going to move to our Q and A session for today's event. Uh, we are going to have. Um, a couple of people field these questions. I believe Christy is going to uh, help us uh, figure out uh, the first question that we will start with. Yes. yes, our first question from the chat box is, do you have any recommendations about uh, at-home blood pressure kits? 
All right, I think uh, we should uh, steer that question toward Dr. Caprio. So take it away, Anne. Absolutely. Uh, so I will say that for home blood pressure monitoring, I don't necessarily recommend a specific brand of blood pressure cuff. Uh, there are a few things to remember whenever you're going to do home blood pressure monitoring. When you purchase a cuff, you want to make sure that it fits you properly. You can often, if you're going to buy this somewhere like um, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, somewhere where there's a pharmacy, there's often someone in the pharmacy who's willing to help you pick one out. Uh, you want to make sure that you have one that fits your arm. So actually, one of the great things that you could do before you go to purchase one is to measure your arm so that you know what the circumference is and you buy the right size. Having the wrong size blood pressure cuff can actually give you either an elevate, falsely elevated or falsely depressed number. And uh, the other thing that I recommend usually is that you use the arm cuff instead of the wrist cuff. The wrist cuff can give you a good idea, but they're very touchy. So you need to make sure that if you're using a wrist cuff, that you are following the directions specifically, that you are not moving, that you have it at the level of your heart because they're very finicky. Excellent information. Thank you so much, Anne. Christy, our next question. Our next question is probably another one for Anne. Is tachycardia the same as AFib? And if not, would that also lead to a stroke? That is a great question. Um, tachycardia and AFib can be related. So AFib is a heart rhythm where your heart beats at an irregular rate and also where the top chambers of your heart don't always completely squeeze and get all of the blood out with each pump of your heart. And that puts you at risk for stroke because whenever you have that fibrillation uh, or quivering of the top chamber of the heart, blood can pool and clots can form. So atrial fibrillation can cause tachycardia. It can be one of the symptoms. Tachycardia is a high heart rate. It's really the, the fancy medical word for a fast heart rate. Tachycardia is not always related to atrial fibrillation. It can be related to many things, including stress and anxiety, caffeine, um, and other actual medical problems aside from atrial fibrillation. So if you're experiencing symptoms like tachycardia, palpitations, shortness of breath with activity, these are all things that you want to make sure that you are talking to your healthcare provider about and getting checked out. But tachycardia alone does not increase your stroke risk, only if it's related to atrial fibrillation. Thank you, Anne. Our next question, Christy. Our next question is, how can I start adding breathing or meditation into my day? And should I focus on setting a time? Oh, well, I would love for Marcel to uh, take that, Dr. Haddix. Sure. And yes, I would schedule it like we schedule everything else. We're so accustomed to planning and creating lists. Um, you know, even think about, I'm, I'm, rituals are very important to me. And so I start every day. Um, the first thing that I do in my day is to, to do some type of breathing or stretching. And I also read. For 30 minutes um, because reading is a part of my self-care practice um, and I try to journal or, or write and so it's something that has to be a regular part of every day and not to overwhelm yourselves even if it's just three to five minutes you know so finding a time um, that works for you that you can put it in your planner if, if that works um, or knowing that you know at the start of each day or right before you go to bed um, that you have it set as a routine, a ritual that you engage um, at all times. Uh, Jed, I would love for you to chime in on this question as well about breathing and meditation. Should there be a set time? Well, I found in teaching my patients, a set time really works well for some people, but oftentimes building it into something that's going to happen, building an association. I'll sometimes tell people to maybe just take a few breaths every time they go to the bathroom in a day, right? And when you begin to build these associations, it becomes a part of your life. So for, for people like Dr. Haddix, uh, who is an academic superstar and, and uh, 
all around wonderful human being, that works for her. Personally, I'm a little scattered, right? It doesn't really suit my personality. So what I'll find is that maybe instead of going to the fridge, I can use it to break a habit, right? I'll take a few breaths. Uh, I, I would like, if I can, just to talk a little bit about the intervention that she offered. There are some really, really important key points that I think help anybody to start a new practice. So what, initially she had you check in, just recognize what you feel. This establishes a baseline, right? Then she offered an intervention. In this case, it was breathing and relaxation. And then you check in again and you begin to recognize the difference. And that really can help to show us what the value is. Now, when you're breathing, it's really, really important to do it correctly. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of people. But what I'll teach my patients is to breathe like a balloon. A balloon doesn't blow up from its chest and then its belly, you know, it, it blows up all of a piece. And so learning to begin to feel your entire body expand around that air is a really, really critical thing to do. It can even help to engage your mind by thinking, what is the color of the balloon, right? A good intervention is going to have a, a brain component. I call it the basis of a good intervention with three Bs. The basis is a brain component, a body component, and a breath component, right? That's what Chinese medicine teaches. So it's fairly easy to remember. So by picturing what color is the balloon, feeling that balloon expand, a balloon doesn't blow itself up. So the focus is on the inhale. So we inhale, feel everything expand, rest with it for just a moment. That pause is in fact so, so important. And then just let it all go. If you move into meditation, you, you recognize initially whatever you happen to recognize, something on your mind, a feeling in your body, a sound, as you pause and hold your breath, you just be with it for a moment. And then when that air leaves your body, just let it all go. The attention, the stress, everything. And that clears the slate for the next round. Jen, thank you. Christy, our fourth and final question from the chat. Uh, that's actually all we have for the chat box if you want to uh, finish out with our panelists. Super, yeah. Uh, well, what I would love for all of our panelists to do to stay on uh, screen with us, including David, uh, we'd love to hear from all of you about uh, a takeaway that you have uh, from today's panel, a brief takeaway or a call to action that you have for those watching right now or the community that watches in a few days. We'll, uh, we'll start in order of speaking. So we'll start with you, David. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my biggest takeaway here is to try to make some quiet time for myself. Uh, thank you for, for um, the breathing uh, method, the sessions, the kind of uh, a tranquil uh, type setting because I, I'll be able to even do that at work. I'll close my office door. I'll put the new do not disturb sign on for, you know, five or six minutes. And I'll just be, I guess, be with myself. And uh, so I thought, I, I found that very interesting. Wonderful. I agree with you as well. I may have to step out of the newsroom and go to a different <laughs> uh, closed door area to do it myself. But uh, I think I'll be doing that more often. David, thank you. Anne, how about you? So I think that the takeaway that I would like people to have is that you can understand your risk for stroke and understand your own high blood pressure and advocate for yourself and advocate for yourself by understanding, number one, how to work with your healthcare providers in order to make sure that you are meeting your risk reduction goals and that you're meeting your health goals but also work with yourself and use some of the strategies that we learned today in order to ensure that this is a partnership and not just something that you expect your healthcare provider to do for you, but this is something that you need to work with others and yourself to achieve and reduce your risk of stroke and other health problems. And thank you, Jed, takeaway or call to action? takeaway is you have the power. You have the power. This should be very empowering. There are so many things that you can do for yourself. There are so many options, including acupuncture and other complementary therapies in terms of treatment, prevention. But 
there, there really are so many resources available to you. And I just encourage anyone who has any concerns whatsoever about this to get out there and find out what resources are in their community. Thanks so much, Jed. And Marcel, how about you? Rest is the action. That is the call to action, to find time to rest, to understand that rest is your birthright. Um, we all deserve it that we shouldn't feel guilt for taking time to rest, for practicing self-care, um, and that our rest is fueled by the breath. So, you know, one action is just wherever you are to pause, to take five slow breaths, to notice, and then to just observe how you feel. Excellent takeaways from all of you. Thank you so much to all our speakers today, again, David, Marcel, Jed, and Anne, we appreciate all of your time, but also your expertise and your willingness to share experiences and advice. Uh, we want to thank everyone who joined us today to be a part of this wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, we hope that you enjoyed the Check It Community Conversations and that you have checked your blood pressure or made some healthy lifestyle changes and have figured out ways to take control of your numbers. Uh, in other, thank you to our sponsors who made the 2021 Check It Challenge possible, uh, UHS, Hillrom, Bristol Meyer Squibb, and today's session sponsor, Lords. Uh, the American Heart Association staff, uh, if you know any of them, they're all hard workers and they're already making plans for the 2022 Check It Challenge. And we want to hear from you as they work toward putting that together. A survey will be sent out to all participants. Uh, we welcome your candid feedback. You can also connect with Lisa Neff. That's Lisa Neff, N like Nancy, E-F-F, Lisa.Neff at heart.org. It's on your screen right now. You can contact her directly if you want to know how you can get involved. We wish all of you a wonderful day. Uh, we're glad that you were with us for the 2021 uh, Check It Challenge, but we hope, of course, that you will join us for the 2022 Check It Challenge. Uh, again, have a wonderful day, and I think uh, we speak collectively together as a group to say, take a breath, and when you have a chance today, start looking through that information that you picked up today fast, your numbers, making time for yourself, thinking about uh, treatment versus a treat for yourself. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure to join all of you. I'm Farah Jadrin from CBS 5 this morning and CBS 5 at noon. <laughs>